Good day, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for part two of our personal branding webinar. Today's topic is about the mechanics, how an authentic personal brand produces specific, measurable, trackable benefits. Uh, Rosemary Davies James, um, she founded Miboso, a full service brand agency at 1998. Uh, the agency delivers authentic personal branding and authentic business branding services to clients around the globe. Her agency work in leadership of advertising departments for multinational retail giants supported some of the world's best known brands such as Pepsi, FedEx, Barbie. Today she divides her time between supporting individual authentic personal branding clients and providing an external authentic brand resource to businesses. And with that, I would like to give the word to Rosemary. Thank you very much. That was a great introduction and it's very good to be back. I'm really looking forward to um, sharing the information I have prepared in this webinar because this is actually my favorite part of the whole branding process. Yes, it's important to know what the benefits are, but how it works, I think every professional just really gets into uh, how they do what they do. So without uh, further ado, let's um, sort of move in. Uh, I've prepared an agenda and uh, by providing a thumbnail overview of the authentic personal branding process, what you'll take away from today's webinar are practical insights into the mechanics of personal branding and an understanding of the specific measurable, trackable benefits that an authentic personal brand produces. Now, during this session, we will look at the authentic personal brand's structure from its foundation to its framework, its moving parts, and its optional extras. We're also going to take a look at the fuel that drives your personal brand's engine. And maybe surprisingly, this fuel is made up of information, insights, and actions. We're also going to take a look at the applications, how you apply your brand to drive the results you want. And we're going to take a look at how you operate your brand uh, in order to have it generate those specific measurable, trackable benefits that you want. After the mechanics of the authentic personal brand have been clearly mapped out, I'm going to bring them to life using real data from our client files, but obviously protecting their identity with pseudonyms. Uh, before we conclude this webinar, I'm going to demonstrate how an authentic personal brand can consistently enhance your personal satisfaction, your professional accomplishments, and your financial success. So. Um, in case you missed it, I'd like to do a, a quick recap of what we covered in the first part of this webinar, uh, which really focused on the benefits uh, and how a person, an authentic personal brand expands your options. Um, during that session, 52% of participants said that the people who work with them and report to them know who they are and what they stand for. In other words, they said that they had a brand. But when we asked in a second poll who could articulate their, client, their brand clearly and succinctly if we were to put them on the spot, open up the lines and give them the opportunity to do that, a surprising 73% said that they could not articulate their brand. So before I do the quick review, um, Mariana, let's do our first poll question. And this is addressed to the people who attended part one of the webinar. Okay, here's the first one. How many of you since attending part one of the webinar took action to polish your existing brand statement. Okay, I think that's it. 43% uh, did <laughs> and 57 mm -hmm. did not. Yeah. Well, that's I actually I'm impressed. I was ex I was expecting less to have taken action. So that's that's excellent. Now also in part one, 48% uh, 40 of attendees said that they didn't have or weren't sure if they had a brand. And we also spoke to the necessity of having a brand in today's increasingly competitive business world. So rolling in poll, into poll two, mm -hmm. Mariana, I'll hand this to you. Mm -hmm. How many of you without a brand statement took action and have started developing one? And this is funny because we have the very same percentage here. 43 yeah. that I've started, 57 hasn't. Okay, so they're, they're, they're in action, so that's terrific. Um, it's an interesting result and I'm encouraged because, as we said, uh, the need to stand out in the crowd is even, it, it's more important today than it ever has been just because there are so many people out there um, looking for attention and, and trying to uh, get ahead. So um, I'm going to ask a question now and uh, 
while I'm going through the overview of part one, please feel free just to toss your answers into the chat box. And that question is, for those people who haven't started, what is stopping you from taking action and moving forward uh, on polishing or developing your brand? So while people are typing, I'm just going to do a quick recap on what we covered um, in, in the last session. We started by looking at the top line brand benefits. We looked at four brand secrets and four warnings that you shouldn't even think of applying for a new position raise or promotion until you address. We looked at eight real client complaints that branding resolves and I shared a real client story with you that described how her brand equipped her to ace a number of daunting career setbacks and devastating economic challenges. We compared and contrasted branded versus unbranded individuals and I outlined the opportunity, what's on the table for those seeking authentic personal and business lives through a personal brand, and the opportunity cost, what the people who don't have a brand stand to lose. Uh, I took a few minutes to expose personal branding myths and myth, miss, oh, this is a tongue twister, myths and misperceptions, and I gave you the key to assessing conflicting expert rhetoric because there are a ton of personal branding experts out there in the blogosphere and uh, in the online world. So uh, basically we spent a few minutes and uh, I showed you how to assess their, their rhetoric, uh, expose illogical branding practices, and identify specula speculative claims for what they are. Then I touched briefly on the tangible benefits that a personal brand delivers in terms of both financial gains and increased satisfaction. Now, a poll showed that webinar participants were right on track with my clients in terms of ranking the top brand benefits that authentic personal brands deliver. 57% of webinar voters said increased income was the top benefit, and that agrees totally with uh, the, the clients I've worked with. 54% of webinar voters said increased confidence was next. 25% uh, zeroed in on increased personal satisfaction. 11% picked increased goal achievement. And 4% cited increased efficiency. So that's, that's typically the order in which the benefits showed up. I wrapped up part one of the webinar with a special offer for IV exec members. And I'm going to repeat those details uh, at the end of this session. And uh, there's also a free gift that I would love for you to uh, take advantage of. So um, we have time now. I've wrapped that up to go into another poll. Um, Mariana? And just a second. It's not showing for some reason. OK, here we go. Is this what's stopping you from taking action? I don't want to sign the time. It's not a priority. I don't want to spend the money. I don't believe my investment will pay off. None of these. OK, here we go. So 0% answered, I don't want to sign the time. 15% mm -hmm. it's not a priority. 7% mm -hmm. I don't want to spend the money. Mm -hmm. Again, 7% I don't believe my investment will pay off. And 72% mm -hmm. none of these. OK, awesome. Well, I'll wait to read all of the comments everyone put into the, the chat box because clearly uh, there are other reasons and I'd love to know what they are. So um, let us move forward um, into the body of today's presentation. Let's start by looking at the structure. We're looking at the mechanics of an authentic personal brand and just like uh, any sort of construction, the best place to start is the foundation. Now, when I talk about a personal brand's foundation, these are the concrete and non-negotiable elements of your brand. Uh, they're made up of your natural strengths, uh, perhaps you're a math whiz, a uh, compelling communicator, or a creative genius. Those are really what make you stand out uh, in the crowd. Uh, your foundation also encompasses your enduring passions, preferences, and outlooks. Um, for example, you're a Republican or a Democrat. Um, you're a concrete or an abstract thinker. Uh, your brand foundation also incorporates your ingrained ideals, values, and beliefs. Uh, for example, you're an optimist or a pessimist. You're an idealist or a cynic. Uh, you have strong faith in your God or religion, or you are an equally convinced atheist. These are very ingrained ideals, values, and beliefs. Uh, your foundation 
uh, your brand foundation also takes into account what you will and won't do. Uh, and these are, they, they align with beliefs, but they're, they're, they're a separate category in and of themselves. For example, you will bend the truth to spare someone's feelings, but you won't lie outright for personal or professional gain. Uh, or you will take charge in a crisis, but you don't want to be in a leadership role on an everyday basis. The last two pieces of your brand's foundation are internal perceptions, um, your self-awareness, and external perceptions. So we integrate all of these aspects together. And uh, the interesting thing about those last two points, internal versus external perceptions, is uh, there's a great opportunity in the initial stages of laying your personal brand's foundation to identify and bridge gaps between how you see yourself and how others see you. And this can really be a game changer. It is for a lot of people because uh, I guess it's just the way we're wired as human beings. We can drag old beliefs and old perceptions from something that happened when we were seven years old forward into our life. And they're still there when we're 37 or 47 unless we take the time to really dig into them, expose them, and examine them through adult eyes. And a lot of my clients have had huge breakthroughs in terms of uh, job performance and uh, leadership skills once they do expose uh, those, I guess I'll call it baggage, the baggage that they brought forward and, and really do a great job of matching up how they see themselves with how others see them. So that's the foundation. As with a building, once you've got the foundation uh, laid, you can begin to build the framework on top of it. So when we're talking about your authentic personal brand, um, the framework includes your professional environment. Now, this is the organization and business market you currently work within and or want to work within. So it's your, your present environment or your desired future environment. Your framework also encompasses your personal environment. So uh, are you a freewheeling single or do you have ties to a particular place, a family unit, a community? Uh, your personal environment really is quite important. Uh, your framework also uh, references your personal, or sorry, your professional reputation. How are you seen by your bosses, your peers, your customers and prospects? And it incorporates your professional and personal goals and aspirations, uh, your dreams, your goals, and possibilities you want to pursue. Because when you're framing something up, you have to really make it of a, a shape and size that it, it will accommodate your current needs and your foreseeable future needs. So that's what's involved in the framework. Now we get into the moving parts, and these are elements that you do not have direct control over in most, in, 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 for the most part. So I'll let you know what these are. The moving parts, there's four of them. Uh, one is the economy. So this is the organization and business market that you currently work within or want to work within. Uh, as we all saw in 2008, uh, there are only a very few, few players who can influence the economy and that most of us don't fall within that category. Another moving part uh, that influences your personal brand are fluctuating market demands. Um, so is the, you know, if there's an economic demand for your product or service, for your organization, for your professional role, you're in a really good space. But if what you've studied for and worked in for, say, the last 20 years is a, an aspect of industry that's being phased out, there's an opportunity there for reinvention. There's an, also an opportunity for a massive pity party, but when that's finished, you get to reinvent. Um, competition and innovation, two other moving parts that I've lumped together because um, when you are active in the business world, the competition is active too, and sometimes they, they gain an advantage that can cause a disadvantage to your situation. Uh, innovation too, uh, who would have guessed 20 years ago that uh, we would be connecting through smartphones and social media. Uh, as new innovations pop up, they, they change the game. So competition and innovation are moving parts uh, that uh, impact your personal brand. Uh, the last piece is your availability and capability. And what I mean by that is your, your physical and mental health. Um, how attentive, attentive are you? Um, how available are you in terms of 
uh, if a, an opportunity popped up, would you be able to relocate uh, or would you pass it by because that's not something that interests you? Um, are you open to financial risks, to extensive travel? Are you willing to endure some short-term pain for long-term gain? So that's all about availability and capability. And those are the four moving parts. Now, when we get into the structure, um, I talk about a standard structure because of the thousands of people I've worked with to develop authentic personal brands, there, there are typically two paths. One is a focused career path. For example, I'll work with a C or a V level or executive or, or you know, director or manager. Um, and typically their career is their focus. Now, there may be some additional activities they take on. They may be sponsoring community events or really participating on a board in a voluntary capacity, but their executive role is their prime concern. So that's the focused career path. On the other hand, I've also worked with a number of individuals who run businesses and they are on a focused business path. So they come to me to create a personal brand that complements and supports their business brand, or in some cases when I work with entrepreneurs, they want to create a, a broad scale personal brand that then um, becomes the business brand as well. So those are the, the two uh, structures, standard structures. Um, I talk about op optional extras because a lot of the people I work with uh, are multi-talented. Um, some of them actually do struggle with ADD and ADHD, but a lot of them are just multiply talented people. They are good at all kinds of unrelated activities. So uh, they take the path that I call converging multiple roles. For example, um, bringing to mind a C-level executive who had a, a, a very successful and uh, big career, uh, who also wanted to sponsor um, community contribution through paid board service. And as a, a third piece, they established a charity. So um, that, that, you know, they had a lot of irons in the fire. They were a uh, responsible executive, um, they were very involved in community events, and they uh, contributed greatly to their community, and they were also a paid member of several, several boards. So those are the converging multiple roles on an executive side. Um, the last, or the, the other, I should say, optional extra is when, and this can happen for either uh, business owners or executives, when they want to extend their personal brand to a business or a product that they develop. And it could be something as simple as a book. A lot of executives write books, um, but they need to sort of extend their brand out there to uh, make people that, well, to present the book as something that is believable, is credible, and desirable by the book's target market. So um, in this case, they really convert their successful career experience into uh, an extension of their brand that promotes uh, a product or a business. Because I've also worked with a lot of executives who, after acing their corporate careers, have decided that they want to uh, hang out a shingle and work as, a, as an executive, or sorry, not as an executive, as a consultant or a coach or in some entrepreneurial fashion. So those are the structure. Now we're moving into the fuel. Uh, um, and it, it's most people when I think when they think of fuel, they don't really think of what I'm going to describe. And I already did tip my hand a little bit in the overview. Um, there are a number of different fuels that drive your personal brand's engine. Uh, three I'm going to focus on today. Uh, information. Now, information drives your brand. Uh, you need to gather data to assess opportunities and risks. Uh, you need to complete competitive analysis. You need to know, as I spoke earlier, talking about the, the uh, factors that impact your brand that you can't control. If you do conduct regular competitive analyses, then at least you will be able to keep your finger on the pulse of people who are a threat to you. Um, you've got to 
uh, gather information on market opportunities, um, target market demand, and uh, also checking in on how people perceive you, your reputation. You want to make sure that uh, in these days reputation management is uh, more important than ever because it's very easy for someone uh, to post something about you online and if it's not true it can uh, seriously damage your reputation. So you need to always be managing uh, and on top of the information that directly impacts your brand. Uh, the second type of fuel that drives your personal brand's engine is insight. Uh, you need to constantly be on top of your target market's needs. And just to clarify, um, a target market sounds very much like I'm talking about a business and their customers. When you are an employed executive with a, an executive brand, your target market are uh, your employer, your boss, your peers, the people that you interact with professionally, the people you serve. So you need to stay up to date on their needs and you need to stay up to date on opportunities um, and market demand for the value you offer. And this is where the fuel sort of rolls into benefit statements. That's something that you get when you have an authentic personal brand is a, a list of uh, custom developed benefit statements that make it easy for you to tell people how you can serve them and why they should choose you. You've got your unique selling proposition, which defines what makes you unique and special, and again, influences people when they are choosing between you and some other people with similar skills and uh, expertise. And you've got your value proposition, which really is the mother of all your benefit statements. It's, it's the, the key piece that makes people choose you again and again and again. And part of your insight is to check and make sure that you are still coming across as credible. So uh, there's a way to credential yourself, and that's all part and parcel of the brand. But you need to continually check in and make sure that it's still um, being received as extremely believable. The last piece of the fuel is taking actions, really, to, to, to check on the first two types of fuel fuel. You need to check on the information and check on the insight by uh, market testing the relevance of your benefit statements. These are not things you can develop in isolation. Uh, I've, I've run into people who have done that, uh, working with other brand development uh, specialists, and they're in love with their benefit statements, but uh, th their target market, not so much. Uh, I remember one uh, gentleman in particular who was in love with the concept of espresso. He was a big fan. He loved to drink espresso, loved the pick-me-up it gave him, and he wanted to uh, use it as a description of how he interacted with his clients. He was in the corporate training world. Um, but when he market tested it, he found out that he was the only one who was really in love with the concept of espresso as a description of how he delivered his services. Uh, his target market saw it as uh, bitter, overpriced, and uh, generally not desirable. So market testing is really important. You need to test uh, the, your target market's response to your benefit statements um, and do some message to market matching. Make sure that what you're offering is seen as highly desirable to them. Uh, along the same lines, you need to also test your value proposition and your unique selling proposition. Uh, and be sure that you're being seen as credible, memorable, and appealing. I am a little behind here. Okay, now we're going to take a look at applications. Um, really, this is how your brand drives results. So as you are applying it, it's important to identify goals and create the strategies that will enable you to achieve the goals, pinpoint the tactics that the strat strategies will utilize to uh, achieve your goals, and then Really, applications are all about um, strategizing, um, deploying tactics, uh, executing the plan, assessing how effective it was, uh, refining your approach, and you just repeat. So this is a continual um, cyclical process, the application. Um, operation. This is how you leverage your brand to produce targeted benefits. Now, 
it's important that your brand has appeal. And you, you want to make sure in, in operating your brand, uh, you want your understanding, skills, and insights to be appreciated by your target market. Operating your brand builds consistency, because if there's one thing that a brand must be to be valued and believable is consistent. And I think anyone on the call, probably the best example of this is um, if we step outside of a personal brand is a, a hotel or restaurant experience. You go expecting a certain quality of service, a certain quality of food, a certain quality of accommodation, and probably the first time that your expectations are disappointed um, might be the last time you patronize that establishment. Um, so it's really important to be consistent. We know what we can count on um, certain people for, and you want to become one of those people. So when you have a firmly established appeal when you're operating your brand uh, and you operate it consistently, you build trust, you inspire loyalty, which grows the value or worth of your brand, and it takes you from merely respected to renowned, which in turn increases the dollar value um, and opportunity appeal. I know I went through those quite quickly, but there's, as I said with the first webinar, there's so much data to cover when we scratch the surface of this branding topic that um, I wanted to just give you, give you the nuts and bolts. And if you have any questions, uh, I've got my contact data on the final slide. Please feel free to uh, contact me and ask you questions. Now, I promised you some real data. And really, this is, I, I wanted to share a couple of client stories to bring uh, authentic personal brands to life. Uh, first case study, a client, and I'm going to call him Matt to protect his privacy. He cut his teeth in the Silicon Valley boom and he survived the bubble burst. Uh, he was the top sales producer for his region with one of the world's best known technology firms. Uh, Matt's challenge was that he was at the top of his game professionally, but he really hated certain aspects of his of his job. Uh, there were very long hours. Uh, he disliked the repetition of the sales process um, it, because everywhere he traveled, he basically, I think he told me he felt like a circus monkey performing the same tricks over and over. And, and there was a lot of travel. He was constantly on the road. So those were the things he wanted to get away from, the hours, the repetition, and the travel. Uh, we began working together, and the branding process opened up a number of creative opportunities. Matt saw how he could leverage his strengths and continue to grow his net worth and professional reputation while working on challenges that really interested him. His creativity and ambition got all fired up during the process. So um, I'll tell you a little bit more about his situation. Matt was recently married to his second wife and together they had a large blended family. So he wanted to spend a lot less time at the office. Um, so Here's where he apply, applied his creativity through inspiration that came out of the branding process. He proposed to save his organization hundreds of thousands of dollars by establishing and managing a virtual commuting division. So this, would, this was a scenario where a lot of their technicians would no longer need office space. They wouldn't come into the office, but they would, um, they would, they would work from home or be virtual commuters. Um, his inspiration was that that's how he wanted to work. And uh, he was, given his sales skills, able to successfully pitch his company, which allowed him to achieve his own goal of working from his own office. Uh, as a side benefit, he helped a lot of others increase their quality of life, um, cut their expenses, and optimize their time. Now, as the regional sales leader, Matt took on another, he was inspired with another idea. He took on coaching up and coming individuals and teams in the sales division um, to the point that he actually undertook professional coach training. And again, he sold the organization um, based on expected sales increases, projections of, of sales increases, which he felt very comfortable could be achieved if uh, these teams and individuals, um, high potential individuals, had uh, a little bit more skill training. So how this ties back to his brand is when we went through the initial stages and he got really clear about his strengths, he got very clear about uh, how he was regarded in his industry, he gained such confidence that he was quite comfortable 
putting his neck on the line, as he said, and it really paid off. Um, he found that after these few forays that he really enjoyed innovation and he loved coaching others to sell much more than he enjoyed selling himself. Um, and really he became the, the new process reinvention wunderkind within his organization. As a result, he's got a lot of freedom. He works from home, very occasionally has to go into the corporate office for a meeting. And he's making far more from the innovative concepts than he did from straight sales. Uh, of course, as a, a savvy businessman, he negotiated a percentage of all new revenue gained from the performance boosts that his programs generate. So he's got kind of a, a passive stream of income coming in. Um, another benefit, he's constantly wooed by other organizations, and he also negotiated the right to take on consulting assignments from these other organizations as long as they don't directly conflict with his employer's interests. The net outcome that Matt achieved, he's doing more that interests him, he's earning more, but he's spending less time working overall, and he has more time for himself and his family. As an extra bonus, he's discovered a number of new interests that he now has the time to enjoy, uh, plus he has time for old interests that had always been sacrificed, like going to the gym and working out, taking off for weekends with his wife, and, and committing to vacations with his wife and their six children. So that is, a, is, is Matt's story. It, it didn't come together all that quickly, but that's really the top line of how it worked out. Um, my second case study, uh, again, another gentleman, I'm going to call him Jay-Z. Now, this, this individual was truly exceptional. He came to me with a, a stunning track record of beating the odds and breaking the mold, but he didn't realize how exceptional he was until we went into the branding process. He was born into a, 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 an average Midwest family, and as a teenager, he became passionate about aviation. Like many young boys, he dreamed of becoming a fighter pilot, but unlike many, he actually did. This uh, passion was such a driver that it, it pushed him to excel in school. Uh, he was accepted at Annapolis, where he distinguished himself into a place at Top Gun, training with the best of the best. He was on the front lines in the first Gulf War and advanced to instructing other fighter pilots. And again, as an instructor, he was one of the best, according to his COs and peers. Um, Jay-Z continued his mold breaking when he was diagnosed with stage 2 lymphoma and told he would never fly again. He fought back viciously, uh, using conventional and unconventional medicine, always putting mind over matter. And astonishingly, he was recertified for flight duty a mere nine months after his initial diagnosis. Now, this, all of this happened prior to our working together, but he approached me towards the end of his military career because he knew it would be a tough transition from the Navy to the civilian career that he had set his sights on. And, and he was right. Um, Jay-Z was a gifted mathematician, and he aimed to apply his skills, training, and interests to serve and protect the wealth of high net worth individuals. Now, the process of building his brand proved that he had all the right stuff to be the best of the best in the upper tiers of the financial services market, just as he had been when serving and protecting the interests of the USA. Now, by building a solid foundation and framework, his brand leveraged his outstanding service record and his determination to beat cancer. Uh, it really all came together to position him as a highly desirable wealth management advisor. Uh, it, his attributes were phenomenal. Gallantry, trust, commitment, valor, discretion, the ability to perform under extreme stress, and an acute awareness of risk. All of these were worked into his brand to become highly appealing benefits to the clients he serves. Today, he's a managing director of one of America's top financial firms. So I, we spoke earlier about moving parts. Uh, Jay-Z was just masterful with the moving parts of his brand because his background equipped him to be. Uh, he'd had to manage the multiple moving parts of flying at mock speeds in some of the most complicated aircraft in the world uh, while staying in formation and taking in data from operators and navigation support. Um, while he's doing this, he's identifying and locating threats, aiming and operating deadly weapons, and avoiding unfriendly fire. So clearly, Jay-Z has no problem managing the moving parts of his brand. Uh, his branding process really gave him the proof, the confidence, 
the confidence, the impetus, and the credibility he needed to take wealth man take to wealth management just like a Navy SEAL takes to water. So those are a couple of examples. Um, those case studies are unique, just as every individual is unique, but the benefits gained by the hundreds of top-level executives that have branded themselves are consistent. Uh, they gain confidence from increasing their self-awareness and understanding how they're seen by others. They gain satisfaction by improving the fit of their current role, as Matt did, or by moving into a role where they can focus their strengths, passions, and skills like Jay-Z did. They boost their earnings significantly, increasing their incomes by tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars each year. And they spend less time working, which means their quality of life increases significantly, and they can reassign their free time to pursue other interests or just enjoy their families and their hobbies. Um, to go back to Jay-Z for a second, he splits his free time up between his family and between supporting individuals in their batters, battles against cancer. I actually um, connected him to a couple of people in my network who had been newly diagnosed with cancer, and he was just phenomenal. He was on the phone with them. He, was, uh, he made himself very available and uh, really gave them the, the pep talk that made quite a difference in, in, in their fight. Um, in addition to that, he has made a commitment to raising funds for a charity that he founded that provides educational funding and flight training for children of his fallen comrades in arms. So uh, he, he wouldn't have had the time to do that if he hadn't gone through the branding process and, and really been able to focus his, uh, his skills and passions in the way that he has. Now, if you'd like to read any more about uh, benefits that uh, are gained through the authentic personal branding process, uh, just go to mboso.com slash ravereviews.html, and there are a number of different people uh, that are explaining what they got on that page. Now, um, it's time to talk for a minute about tangible versus intangible benefits. Um, I did some research on this with a, a, a gentleman who was a client of mine who had a, his uh, PhD from Harvard in adult development. And uh, after we worked together on his brand, we collaborated to develop a way to quantify intangible benefits. And how I do that is by asking clients to assign them with a time savings, cost savings, or income boosting number. Uh, for example, um, one I've got a, a a quote, direct quote from a client here who said, my values and those of my employer are now congruent after the branding process. The results achieved by this congruence include increased savings and efficiencies for the company. It's also given me the ability to contribute creative solutions to take business to the next level. And she calculated the value of her congruency, which included increased clar clarity and focus by um, over $20,000 a year. And she went on to say, and I'll read her quote, by identifying what drives success and failures, I identified my strengths and values and I've used them to increase my efficiency. So there's a little bit about converting the intangible into the tangible. I wanted to take just a second and, and compare subjective benefits to measurable benefits. Now, sub subjective information typically are show up as opinions or feelings. They're not generally considered measurable, but they can be. Um, for example, if increased confidence enables you to move through a task more quickly, then it can be measured in time and dollars saved or earned if that time is reassigned uh, and, and used productively. Now, an executive client of mine calculated that by being more productive in his negotiation, time management, and communication, he was able to increase the number of corporate programs he ran for his company, which produced an additional $200,000 in profit for his employer and netted himself a $40,000 bonus. So there's another way to make a subjective into measurable. Now, I wanted to talk for a moment about time gained as one of the benefits of authentic personal branding. When you're employed, increasing your productivity can be seen as a negative. I've been there and uh, I, I understand this completely because why handle work faster when that just results in being handed more tasks? 
How is efficiency an advantage? If you just give it away, it's not. What you need to do is to ensure that you reap the benefits of your brand. Um, you, insert some upfront assessment, measurement, and negotiation. Um, think back to my, Matt's story. He approached his boss with a concept. And if sales targets are not being achieved, maybe you could leverage the insight and confidence that your branding process has provided and propose a solution, if that's an issue for your organization, for example. Whatever your organization is looking to achieve that fits with the skill and value you deliver, it, it, there, there's an opportunity there. So negotiate a scenario that provides a win for yourself and a win for your employer. And it might take the form of a performance bonus, a raise, uh, or even paid vacation time off, additional paid vacation. If you're willing to apply your brand strengths to produce a win for your employer, um, make sure you deal yourself a winning hand as well. And if your boss won't play ball, then look for other ways and other situations where you can leverage your brand to achieve your professional and personal objectives. I'm going to take a brief look at money that your brand can save you. Um, the majority of my clients save money by freeing themselves up from struggling with tasks that they don't like doing or don't do well. Um, instead, they leverage their strengths to generate the funding to outsource or delegate these time-consuming activities that they don't enjoy and don't do well. Um, and when they outsource those, they also outsource the attached stress and avoidance. Um, because none of us leap to do tasks that we dislike and do poorly. So on top of the excessive amount of time these tasks consume, uh, we also get to free ourselves up from the associated dread and procrastination that precedes finally giving up and, and digging in with a big sigh. So you don't have to go there at all. Um, measuring benefits money gained. A um, few words about this. We've spoken at length about earnings and gaining income already, but I just want to recap the key points. If you're setting up a brand, uh, it's important to set a baseline that measures how much you earn and how much that increases over time currently. Um, Non-commissioned executives typically get a yearly raise or bonus, but when you negotiate with your boss and they accept your offer to provide additional value for additional gain, you can expect bonuses or salary bumps um, or additional vacation to be awarded more frequently. And you'll see on this, uh, on this chart, on this slide, that there are uh, little circles with uh, wins, uh, win number one, win number two, win number three. These would be, um, in terms of Matt's story, when he actually got the approval to do his, um, his, his sales coaching uh, process. And, and it produced results, he got a bit of a bump. So that's what those different circles are on the chart. So um, I suggest, strongly suggest that all of my clients set up charts like this and they take note of the wins and uh, track the financial gains. Many of my executive clients end up getting multiple bumps in a single year. And although some companies prefer to pay out a lump sum bonus at the end of the year instead of the end of projects, the key really is to baseline spot opportunities and add value, and most importantly, to negotiate a share in the profits. Um, and when you track the results of these efforts, you're going to have a factual record of the annual value of your personal brand, whether it's 15000 50000 or 500000 I can. Tracking benefits. Um, most of our executive clients set up three charts to track their brand ROI. Uh, one chart is time gained, a second chart is money saved, and a third chart is money gained. And obviously the illustrations are just for illustrative purposes, the, the pictures I just showed you. Most people do it on the computer. Uh, I always suggest that my clients work to a plan and develop a forecast on each chart, then compare their actual results to their forecasts. Now, this might seem like extra work for no reason, but when you take the time to develop your forecast, you tap into the power of metaphysics. Uh, establishing targets presents you with tangible goals, and the simple act of focusing on what you want and believing that you can achieve it is not only empowering, but it, it really does get everything lining up for you. As a former international tax accountant and master metaphysician, Mike Dooley, a friend of mine, says, 
thoughts become things. Now, um, I, I just wanted to give you this access to this link, uh, the full story, how does a personal brand help you achieve personal fulfillment and financial rewards? Uh, I've written an article uh, on this that's posted at examiner.com um, and simply called When is a Person a Brand? And it's, it's part four of a series, but it, if you use this link, it really does take you into um, you know, the, the nitty gritty. It talks about the positive cycle that uh, gets established when you start leveraging your brand to achieve results. So, whoops, before we get there, um, I wanted to take a last poll. Uh, Mariana, are you yes. ready to roll? Thank you. Yes, here it is. Are you planning to, are you planning to take action and start developing your personal brand in the next 30 days? Yes or no? 100% yes. Okay, oh no. My. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> Jesus, actually. But it was the full It was that way for a few minutes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's wait a little bit more. No problem. Okay, I think we're all set now. We have 98% yes and 2% no. All right. Well, you know what? I, I'll take 98%. 100 was a little <laughs> too much to believe. So, okay. Very good. Okay, well, now we are into our Q&A session, and I would love to field some questions. Okay, so we have a few very interesting questions. Uh, meanwhile, please do feel free to type in any additional ones if you do have them. Uh, we do have a lot of comments on, on your first two or three questions uh, at the very beginning of the presentation, but let me start Perfect. with some actual ones um, that you can answer uh, in the meantime. Um, one of our attendees is unclear on how much of personal branding is only for his knowledge and how much he should share with the potential employer. So we're ah, starting from the very beginning question. of the presentation. Great question. Um, and this, I'm really glad this question came up because it's where a lot of people get confused. Um, a lot of people get so excited in the first stages of brand development, you know, that they're gaining all this insight and learning all these things about themselves that they start kind of putting all that information out there. And I think the best rule of thumb to use is that what you put out there will answer the question that someone else might ask, what's in it for me? <clears throat> so, you know, you might find it fascinating to realize that people value you for X, Y, and Z points, but um, really, you know, that becomes the foundation. But what you put out there are, um, you know, how you serve others, the value you provide. Um, you you put their benefits out there. They don't need to know all of the other aspects, except when it comes to um, presenting yourself as credible, believable, and solid. So the only place that there's a crossover between what you've learned about yourself and what you pr how your brand presents you to the world is you, in your credentialing statement because you have to um, really connect the dots for people. You know, this is who I am. This is what influenced me. This is the experience I had. And because of these things, this is what I am able to do for you. So you've got to give them some logic and, you know, proof and have it make sense to them that they should trust you to provide the value you say you can deliver. Okay, here's the next one related to the case study you, you, you mentioned. How mm -hmm. long were the engagements with Matt and Jay-Z from the time of first contact to where they are today? Um, gosh, good question. Now I've got to think. Um, <laughs> I started working with, uh, I'll go with Jay-Z first because he was he, it was the, a while ago. So I first started working with Jay-Z in 2004. And uh, we developed his brand. And uh, I guess we worked together, because we, we also put together a website for him, so it extended a little bit. I guess we worked for, together for about four months at that point. And he has been back to me uh, a couple of times since because um, he had a, f a few slight deviations in his long-term plan as things developed and as he evolved. He was, uh, his first position was with uh, one of the Lehman Brothers firm, which after 
uh, the fall of 2008 wasn't there, so we had to do, that was one of those uh, moving parts that we needed to get around, so we had to sort of tweak his brand and uh, redirect it in a, in a more uh, solid direction. So I guess we've worked together three or four times since 2004. Each engagement, like the first one was the longest one, was about four months. Uh, where he hired me to build his brand for him. But since then, um, you know, just a couple of weeks here and there. Uh, with Matt, we worked together also for three months, and I believe that was in 2007. And uh, so we worked together for three months. We, we stay, I stay in touch with all the people I've worked with. It's, you know, we, we build a bond and, uh, you know, he checks in, lets me know what, what's going on and we stay connected. But uh, it was only a three-month engagement and uh, it's just continued to work out uh, very well for him. Perfect, thanks. Okay, here's the next one, very interesting. What does the presenter have to say to those of us who have a brand of being reliable, efficient, and helpful can sometimes result in being taken for granted and expected to burn both ends of the candle to deliver what is requested uh -huh. from peers? Um, I guess my, my response to that, and I used to fall into that category too, which is why I was chuckling, um, operational definitions, negotiations up front. Um, it's, it's really important to clarify what you will and won't do, otherwise, you know, it's just human nature. If, if people can take advantage of you, they tend to, and if it's keeping you away from your family or other interests, that's just not acceptable. So, you know, even if you're in a situation where you've been taken advantage of for years, um, I suggest it's really important to um, speak to the people who are the the offenders, if you will, the people who constantly call on you, and uh, negotiate uh, negotiate with them. Say, okay, this is what I will do, and if you want me to do more than that, then you know it, it's going it, it's either not going to get done, or it's going to have to wait, or there's going to be additional. Um, uh, payment required, uh, you, you, or you, you simply, you know, this is as much as I will do and don't ask me to do anymore. So however the situation works best, just, you know, draw a line in the sand and uh, do not do not step over it because if you step, if you do that and then you step over it, all your good work is going to be dismissed as, you know, not very serious. Okay, thanks. Here's the next one. Can you share several personal brand statements so we can see what one looks like? Um, actually, I can't because my memory's not that good. Um, a personal brand statement is, uh, I could give you some samples if you're able to post them somewhere, Mariana, because they, they tend to be uh, a paragraph or two long, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. And again, it's an internal document that most of my clients use to, um, you know, just really get grounded in who they actually are as opposed to who they thought they were before they began the branding process. It incorporates their self-awareness and also the 360 uh, feedback that they've gained from their personal and professional networks. So it's basically, it's just a mirror. It's like, okay, this is who your brand has proven you to be in, in, and here are all your nuances, which is why they tend to be a couple paragraphs long. So if you can facilitate that, I'd be happy to, to provide a couple samples, but I cannot yes. recite one off the top <laughs> of my head. I'm sorry. No worries. We can definitely arrange that because we will follow up um, afterwards with the recording and, and the rest of the information. So I guess we could add a few statements if, if okay with you. Just, you know, send it over mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll forward. Perfect. Okay. So that's all set. Here's the next question. Does the brand need continuous attention and tweaking as circumstance change? Yes, absolutely. And that might sound like a lot of work, but really it's not. Um, if you continue to keep yourself aware, um, you know, just be awake, aware, pay attention to what's going on in the world around you, you will see um, where tweaks need to be uh, put in place. So it's it, it's it's kind of just like managing yourself. Um, you don't want to be, let, let's just say, as time passed and smartphones came along. If you are a professional working for a tech company, you would naturally migrate your um, phone use to a smartphone because not doing so would be 
very bizarre, if, you know, given <laughs> where you're working and, and what you do. So it's, it's pretty much as natural as that. You see an opportunity, you do a tweak, um, you know, and likewise, if something that you were doing um, is no longer relevant, it, it just drops away. It, it's, you do need to stay attentive and aware, but it's, it's kind of as natural as not dressing in last season's um, fashions. You know, it, it, it becomes just hardwired in. Excellent. Okay, here is the, the next one. We still have a few more minutes. Um, we spoke about the personal brand on multiple levels, but where do the concrete elements of the brand live? The resume, cover letter, website, LinkedIn profile, where uh -huh. else? Where else? <laughs> Great question. Well, most of uh, my clients are equipped with this, you know, sort of a stash of documentation. They've got their personal brand statement, they've got their value proposition, their benefit statements, um, and really they, your, their unique selling proposition, it's, it's kind of like pulling from a library. Um, you have bits and pieces of them in, of them in all sorts of different places. So um, that's one of the values is you have the documentation and you can adapt it to your situation. You might use, and, and oftentimes there are um, different benefits that you would pull forward. Let's say you're at a networking meeting and you, you know, you're meeting a lot of people, you've got your 30 second elevator pitch. Um, if it's this type of networking meeting, you would pull out this set of benefit statements because these are relevant to the people that you're meeting with. If you're at that sort of networking meeting, you'd pull out that set. So um, they, they live in, um, in, they live in all those places. And more because they're you know you, you can bring them out in dialogue you can uh, m make them part of every presentation every time you pitch yourself you have the ability to pull forth um, something that makes you believable something that makes people choose you something that um, makes you memorable and you know because those really when you look at the the key parts of branding uh, the four questions that branding answers are who are you and what are you one of and what are you one of uh, is a statement that lets people categorize you because, you know, oh, you're a financial person, oh, you're a creative person. So who are you and what are you one of? Who do you serve? Um, why should I choose you? And why should I believe you? Those are the four key questions that branding answers. And they tend not to get asked by most people, but they're always top of mind and that's that's what their other questions actually are trying to to flush out when they have a conversation with you so okay perfect so I guess we do have time for just one more question and then we'll have to wrap it up um, this is a question on the part of quantifying your achievements mm -hmm. um, certain assignments that one is in are extremely confidential in nature and therefore explicitly quantifying achievements may not be appropriate Having said that, the achievement may be a team effort, and therefore also it may be difficult to single out individual achievement. So how should one go about tackling such a scenario? Well, I think, again, I'm, I'm not sure of all the moving parts in um, that, that particular situation, but um, it, it's always possible to say that, you know, you are one of a team of, 20 people that undertook a, an innovative project that resulted in expanding market penetration by 25% and produced uh, additional revenues of XX dollars. Like you, you can usually break it down to the very core points, you know, the points that someone reading a resume will want to um, know about you without divulging uh, any confidences that can't be divulged. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. I, I guess this should be all for, for today's presentation. Okay. We do have more questions, but I would definitely love to invite all our attendees to contact Rosemary directly. No. Um, I'll just go to, go to you may oops, and then and, and I've got an offer and a gift. Do I have yes. 30 seconds to talk about those? Absolutely. Yes. I, have, <laughs> I have presented some very special offers for um, everyone with us today and last week. 
Um, there's three offers. One is our on-demand three-part The Truth About Personal Branding series, which shows you how to benchmark, boost, and track your brand's ROI. Now, it's delivered on-demand every weekday in bite-sized audio and PDF formats, and you can have it completed in less than 30 days. There's 17 different uh, pieces to it. So if you're ready to dip your toe into the personal branding water, it's $25 for this program, and you can use what you learn there to give your brand an invigorating tune-up. And if you don't have a brand yet, or if you have one that you need help expressing, we can help you compete on a higher professional level and measure your gains with our 26-step authentic personal branding system. Now, what I'm offering here is a personal how-to brand development instruction and support, uh, a webinar series for less, or for actually the same as the cost of the system alone. So basically, it would be four weeks a webinar, uh, and there's full details on. Um, ivyexec, or mimoso.com slash ivyexec, and so there's that way, it's sort of a class format, I'll answer all your questions as you work through the process, and if you decide after having joined us in these webinars that you need a brand, but that personal brand development, tracking, and monetization are not your strengths, uh, I have an incredible offer for you in as much as I will build your brand for you and I'll take 25% off my best price. So um, take a look at maboso.com slash ivyexec and uh, pick whichever of these offers best support you in achieving your brand of success. There we go. That's my pitch. <laughs> Thanks, don't forget so to ask for your free gift. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Rosemary. Thanks for, for really uh, inspiring and informative presentation. Um, and I would, again, love to thank you all for, for attending today's webinar. I hope to see you soon on our next presentation. Thank you yes, all. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a great rest of the week. Bye-bye.